From signal to story, 50 years of WNIT public television is brought to you by our presenting sponsors. Barb and John Fair Foundation. Congratulations to WNIT on your 50th anniversary. Thank you for 50 years of great entertainment and education. Gurley Leap Automotive Family. Mel Hall. And our Gold Level Sponsors. our Silver Level Sponsors. Thank you. This is your mother ship. This is, this is KUHT in Houston, Texas, in the first public television station. The role of public television is ever changing. Yesterday, when the station first started, it was one thing. Uh, today, it's another. Tomorrow, it's going to be something else entirely. Uh, I think one of the consistent roles over the years has been service to young children. I go to different events and I hear people sometimes tell their stories unprompted how they grew up on Sesame Street or some other PBS program. So PBS has, and its programming has been in the hearts of people for 50 years. Yeah, we've grown so much over the course of uh, you know our 50 years, but really in the last six years, five to six years, we've kind of just really, I would say we've almost blown our own minds as to what we've done uh, between uh, partnering with Michigan Learning Channel as our fifth station, having a dedicated 24-7 PBS Kids channel, also um, being able to bring in an individual to be our education liaison who's out in the community on a daily basis and working with all of the, uh, the entire area that we serve. So my dad was John William Meany. He was a man of ideas. He was ahead of his time in many ways. And uh, he wanted to use the mediums of film and later television to educate and improve society. John Meany, um, as I recall, was a professor at Notre Dame, and part of his curriculum included communications. He was very interested in public television and how it would move in a, a direction that it ought to move. KUHT was the first public television station in the country. And my dad and two colleagues started it at the University of Houston in 1958. It was the first one that anyone had made a success. It worked so much so that other places in the country began to catch on and, and start other stations. And we moved to South Bend in 1967 and he began teaching at Notre Dame and then he realized that, gosh, this community could use a public television station. So he set about trying to start one. South Bend Elkhart was an area probably the most populous in the United States, still unserved by public TV. Dad was on the South Shore train in 1968. And he was on his way to obtain a license for the station to broadcast. And he was playing with call signs. And he wrote down WNIT, Watch Northern Indiana Television. And that's what you became. Uh, there were several people uh, who got together and made it happen, um, thinking uh, John Meany. Uh, Ernestine Racklin, 
Ardisio, Jerry Hammis, Dar Wycamp, and Jane Warner. You know, we have those folks to thank for having a strong PBS station and one of the best, I think, in the country right here. Mom and Dad both believe very, very strongly uh, in South Bend, and they both believe very, very strongly in education. So when this came across their field of vision as something that might, uh, might work in South Bend and something that we could use in the future going forward, I think they both very enthusiastically jumped on board and, and wanted to see, uh, see if they could make a difference with something like public television, which was still pretty new. My dad, Clem, got a call from Tom Brubaker um, way back in the day about the idea of a PBS TV station in South Bend and wondered if he wanted to be the, the chief engineer and start uh, building the station. And uh, from that point on, they were looking at sites and they came up with the Elkhart Area Career Center that was fairly new at that time, had a TV studio built that was completely empty and I remember I was just a child at that point, touring the empty room. And then fast forward, there was a road trip with actually Tom Brubaker, his wife, uh, my mom, my dad Clem, up to Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, where they purchased uh, a lot of the gear from a TV station that uh, went defunct up there. We had really no money for spares. And so if you had something go wrong with a transmitter, you were off the air for a period of time, or you had to uh, use the term jerry-rig it to keep it running to where you might have all your audio and video signals going through just the audio transmitter portion, which is much lower power. So we got a bit of a reputation of, as the fuzzy station. It didn't go nearly as far, the signal was not as good. Um, and so it was really quite a challenge. I remember getting an old decrepit bread truck that we had with a couple of CETA students, a government program to train young people, and driving to Rockford, Illinois, and picked up an old secondhand Klystron and madly driving back and putting the transmitter to get back on the air. It was, uh, it was very much a chewing gum and bailing wire time. Well, uh, you know, Clem, he was, what a great guy. Um, and, you know, he was uh, pulling together equipment, new and old and very old, um, and, and assembling it and, uh, you know, managing, you know, the whole engineering infrastructure. And, um, and, and while we each had our role and responsibility, um, Clem and others would often come in and say, hey, I, <laughs> I need to carry this thing, or I need to stand over here and let me plug this in and see if this works. And you know, so there was a lot of, hey kids, let's put on a show at atmosphere going on. Um, but we, I think, and we were very excited about the, the goal that we had to, to get this, this show on the road. So uh, after the station was built, um, at some point in time there, uh, Whirlpool called up uh, my dad and said, hey, we're tearing out our TV studio would you like our gear? And so uh, they sent a truck, and I believe at the time it was probably a very ratty old Dodge bread truck that they used to have, up to uh, Benton Harbor to pick up the gear and, and brought it back uh, to the station and started implementing what they can. They were, they were literally scraping parts together to get a station built. Auction was eight days of insanity. The auction was about a month long project. We had to shut down all of our production. And then we had armies, literal armies of volunteers. It took an, a whole year to put this together because if you figure every five minutes we had to have eight items. It was real live television, real live chaos. My first time directing that auction was, um, that was a, it was an ordeal, I mean, it was fun. I just remember it being so busy and chaotic and even during the day before the auction got started, it was just crazy producing one little piece or another. It was an incredible amount of battle training for just TV in general and not really something that you get to do that much. Even in the early 90s, it was kind of a rarity in local TV to be able to do that kind of thing. 
auction was a fundraiser for public television where local merchants would donate items to be sold at the auction. You'd either see someone with a board reading items, having the camera go across. You could see a jacuzzi with people sitting in it and they're talking about this great item uh, that the auction brought in. You could be seeing a slideshow with the Holiday Rambler giving a full description. You would see a bank of phone operators. You would see the people that were in charge of the phone operators that made sure they had bid runners, because in the beginning they had bid runners. Well, WNIT Auction was probably the biggest volunteer event they would have throughout the year. I started with it when I started at Crow in 1984, and we had, I think, 12 nights of auction at that point, so we went straight. For Crow, over that period of time, we would have about about 25 people in the studio every single night and it was just a it was really a party for us to volunteer people that learned about the station or watched the station because of their their kids or their family or their parents or their grandparents they would be part of the organization they want to volunteer they want to come out and work for the station so it was a lot of fun to just get together and enjoy each other and actually promote the community and promote the businesses that underwrote the auction it was crazy it was exciting. Um, you know, Peggy and I recruited volunteers to help with the this, this stuff we did. And the volunteers found it just incredibly fun because there was so many things going on and there was always somebody who had something that suddenly had to be fixed and there was people running around in the background. All of a sudden, somebody grabbing your arm and pulling you back saying, no, you're in the camera shot. You know, you're, 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 you're in the background, pull back. Some of our volunteers would bring their children to help stage the merchandise and they got a taste of what it was like to be on live television, which was wonderful. It also got them to volunteer and help out with the organization and subsequently other organizations as well. We had three cameras when we first started we had all these people in the studio. There were probably 150 people in the studio yelling and screaming and hollering and doing different things. And he had all these products that we were auctioning off. And it was just, it was mayhem. It was just complete mayhem. It was fun, but it was just very crazy. And you, when you directed it, you just get, you'd do an hour, hour and a half shift and that's as long as you could go. Because you had to take a break and somebody else had to step in and direct because it was never, never stopped. It was just ongoing, ongoing, ongoing. And we did it every evening for about five, six hours. So it was our huge fundraiser at that time. And it was a lot of fun to do. Uh, when I look back on it, it was fun. At that time, it was very stressful and very, but still very exciting. It was exciting, it was exhausting. It was the yin and yang of our television day, our year. <laughs> We had to empty the studio, we had to build the set, we had to light it, we had to deal with tons and tons of gifts. We built houses, I don't know if you still do that. We used to build auction houses and auction off a house. It was amazing. We had people from other stations and they would come and support us. And we had the sports guys, Bob Nagel, Jack Nolan, and they, they would come and uh, Posey Tucker came and it, it, it was uh, really a whole community. Part of the uh, attraction of the auction was the sports memorabilia. And every night there would be something really special, like an autographed football from Notre Dame or an IU basketball uh, autographed. And I was able to bid on a jersey of Walter Payton, who used to be with the Bears. I still have that jersey today. Bob Lux was um, a pretty cool guy. I worked with him in the sports department at WSBT when I was doing sports broadcasting. And then I was so, um, it was wonderful to work with him on the auction. The first time um, I got involved, naturally Bob got me involved in it. So it was behind the scenes, time for the cookie board to come out. And I was all ready to point to the first item and there was nothing on it, <laughs> nothing at all. It was completely blank. And so they quickly took the pick, quickie board away and Bob just started talking like he always does. He could just fill in wonderfully. And they put all of the stuff on. Nobody ever knew that that happened. And the footballs that he donated, 
He always made sure that they were one of a kind. So for instance, uh, one football would have all of the Notre Dame coaches on, football coaches, all of them. So he would always tell that at the auction, that you know, people that he had signed, and that's what made the ball special. People really loved, you know, watching the auction. They kind of put it in their calendar. And still to this day, they ask me, when are you going to do that again? And, or let's have a reunion. When the auction went off the air, you know, things change and you do go in different directions. That's when we, when we went more into local production. And you, if you're a small station, you can't do it all. So you have to do what you do best and our, our volunteers were a great part of that. We had high school students who came to the Career Center and among many other things, learned how to run cameras, master control, uh, teleprompters, and all of the aspects of television uh, at the site, at the Career Center. We were tight with the art department, so uh, the art teacher students would help us out with art projects and uh, Horticulture could help us out with set decoration. Photography could help us out in the studio with different things. It was, it was an interesting uh, conglomeration, like <laughs> amalgamation of, um, of talent and people and personalities. Jerry Dodd was the production manager hired by Tom Brubaker. Jerry could bring people in, volunteers, students from the Career Center, many many people and he he had such a gentle nature about him that he became for me the go-to person and uh, jerry was able to get the cameras working and connect all the videotape and, and and kind of put together a show and he was a very kind of mellow guy but uh, but smart and uh, and was able to, to make it happen. We want education to be an opportunity for everyone to learn and grow. So we utilize the resources of PBS and the resources with our partners here in the community to give those educational opportunities to not only those that can afford it, but also those that cannot. So I came to WNIT when I was in high school. I had emailed the station and said, hey, I'm a high schooler, I want an internship. At the time, I wasn't sure if I wanted to go on to college or what I was gonna be doing, uh, but I'd done some video with my brother and in high school for the yearbook, and it was like, man, I just want to uh, learn more. So I emailed the station, came in and had a, a meeting with originally Rodney and then eventually Brenda, and showed them some of the videos I made, and they're like, yeah, come on down and we'll teach you more. And that was uh, kind of the beginning where I discovered this is really what I was passionate about. I learned about documentaries and live TV and that I wanted to do this as a future career. It's not just a place where they're going to shadow and just watch for the entire time that they're here. We're going to have them shadow for a little bit, learn how to, how to do it from other people, and then put them into the actual position that we need them to work and then rotate them around. The station's partnership with Ivy Tech grew out of a conversation that I had with the uh, chancellor of Ivy Tech in, in South Bend, Michigan region, who was sharing with me in one conversation that we had about how it was kind of expensive to keep up with the uh, equip equipment needs of that program. And, and of course, I'm thinking to myself that that's something we have to do because that's our core business but also to have students that could come in and learn their craft with people that are the professionals in the business that we were was something that might make a good partnership um, between uh, Ivy Tech and the station. Interns uh, and students have been a part of WNIT for as long as I can remember, ever since I started. Because a lot of times with interns, you teach them, you feel like they're really getting it, and then you had to say goodbye. Whereas Ivy Tech students, when we had them for two, three semesters, they really were able to develop a lot more, see how our productions work, but also become a critical part of how we produced and filling roles on productions. When I think about my experience here at WNIT, I imagine it much like a puzzle. You started off in the beginning and each piece that you put in there gives you the bigger picture. 
And uh, this is what I've seen, experiencing here on studios, on set, from the lighting, the audio, the uh, getting things done in the production and engineering, how it all comes together, and then to see the, the finished results. It really helps you to see the hard work and appreciate the hard work that goes into production and uh, create what it is that we see on the screen. WNIT belongs to me. Uh, actually, was an idea that I believe was originated by uh, Laura Coyne. And uh, there was a, a lot of work in terms of deciding what it would look like. But the whole point was to say, you know, if you're watching WNIT, then you must care a little bit about the programming that's going on. And so let's, again, show the community from all of Michiana, going into Michigan, uh, Rochester, Plymouth, over to Niles, all over the place, and all kinds of people. And it would be children or professionals or just all different kinds of people watching and uh, learning about WNIT and that it belongs to everybody. And it, it would might be two children standing uh, beside their horse or uh, their whatever and saying my name is X and I'm from Elkhart, Indiana. My name is and WNIT belongs to me. And that campaign was really popular and it was just a lot of fun. I would remember seeing people that were fishing on the river turn and look at me as I'm driving by. WNIT belongs to me. I mean it really it really caught on. The sense of belonging was something that's one of human beings' strongest passions. So we came up with WNIT belongs to me, meaning you. And uh, we had various ways of getting the word out. The best one, I think, is see more. Seeing more tele good quality television uh, gave birth to a a very tall five-year-old named Seymour, who was our mascot, and we went out into the community. Seymour was at the opening day of Kovaleski Stadium, and he was in a lot of uh, daycares, uh, giving countless hugs along the way. We were a bunch of kids. I mean, you, you can't imagine this now, but other than our General Manager Tom Brubaker, Clem Kiespert. Um, I don't think there were any of us at the start that were over 30. I was 20. And we were in control. I mean, it's sort of like you, uh, a little more professional version of Wayne's World, where we're all there and we're getting to do this stuff. Once we got some camera gear and we were able to outfit the huge studio we had, we started off with just some short little programs that we featured at the end of pro programs that we were running because a lot of the programs we had didn't run a full hour. So we would fill that in and have somebody in the studio doing that. Well, Patchwork was that first show that we did with the United Way Agency people, and then they, they actually Patchwork then became a half hour, but then Reflections was kind of went deeper in with one person. I was able to do some really fascinating interviews. Um, we did a woman who had just had a mastectomy, and that was really um, kind of a new area to go into, and she was very upfront about it. We did someone that had been deprogrammed as a Mooney. I don't know if you remember the, the Moonies of the time. Um, that was very interesting. Um, so we really had a, quite a wide variety of different kinds of people and situations. So we aired a lot of children's programs direct from public TV, I mean, the, the gamut, Sesame Street, Electric Company, Zoom, that sort of thing. Uh, we had a variety of things that got bicycled in, uh, Lilius Yoga and You, uh, some various things where the tapes would show up and we'd air those. But then we also pretty much had free reign to go out into the marketplace and get syndicated shows or whatever. So, you know, this is also the 50th anniversary of the station. It's also the 50th anniversary of Saturday Night Live. 
Oh. Do you remember <laughs> when Gary Weinstein was trying to get Saturday Night Live onto Channel 34? I, I don't. How yeah. about that? No. He, the, the show was on, and WNDU, the NBC affiliate, owned by Notre Dame, I think was a little skeptical about putting this crazy program mm -hmm. live from New York. And, and Gary had the idea, if they're not going to do it, we'll do it. Because <laughs> I think our programming ended at like 11 o'clock or something that, on Saturdays. And he was kind of pushing the, the, the narrative. I think we were being used a little bit by NBC to force the, <laughs> the clearance on the NBC affiliate. But we came somewhat close to getting Saturday Night Live onto WNIT, which would have been a great fundraising opportunity. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> And that reminds me a couple of other things. Um, one is before we were on the air, I th think it was WNDU aired Sesame Street. Oh. Independent, just Sesame Street as a one hour thing. Right. I mean, Sesame Street back then, and in some ways still is, the sort of premier children's TV program. Certainly at the time, it was better than absolutely anything else available on public or, or commercial TV. Um, but you're talking about Saturday Night Live made me remember that we also took the, uh, the gamble of airing Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman, <laughs> oh, right. which was a syndicated <laughs> program, as I recall. So it didn't, wasn't offered through a network, but for its time, it was considered pretty- Cutting uh, edge. Cutting edge, yeah. a little yeah. bit racy, a little bit odd. Yeah. And nobody, commercial, and it was a commercial program, but nobody locally picked it up. So, and I don't know if, if Gary was the program director yeah, at the time. Yes, so, yeah. he was. Um, picked it up and we aired Mary Hartman, Mary and, Hartman. And had an underwriter, right? I think so, <laughs> I for think quite a long it. time. And um, that was an unusual thing for a public TV station to do, but I think Gary was reading the market and saying there's an opportunity here, so let's, let's go for it. You know, we did, we did things like that back then, <laughs> which was, I, th which I think were good. Um, yeah to establish our uh, presence in the market and our connection to the audience. So I ended up doing several things. One was taking a, a live feed from the David Frost, Richard Nixon interviews. Again, the local stations were not interested in it. So I pursued that. And that was one of the big things that we did. It was really important for the public to be able to get the reflections of Richard Nixon. When I was hired at WNIT, and I was 28, I knew that there was a real opportunity to do something different. And so there were two things that I wanted specifically to do was to provide, provide quality programs for the general public. And also, it was important for me to challenge the local audience to things that they may not have normally been used to. Yeah, well, I, I didn't start as a director. I became a director eventually, but I was a volunteer at first. But uh, and then uh, camera operator and audio person. Then, uh, then I got to do some directing, and I directed about three thousand shows, maybe. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> um, talk shows, some uh, entertainment stuff. We did uh, some musicians that were came in, and lo both local and people traveling through the area. One of the the cool things about working there back then and being a PBS. TV station in its infancy was the fact that even as a production engineer, I ran camera once in a while and actually directed a few shows one later on <laughs> and got your feet wet in so many different areas that True. you wouldn't have been able to do otherwise. Certainly, yeah. What was Straight Talk? I sort of modeled it on some of the interview shows that I thought well of. So, for example, at the national level, it was like Dick Cavett, he interviewed all kinds of people. and. I saw doing something like that. Of course I would interview local and state regional politicians, maybe some few national politicians. If celebrities were available, and not that many celebrities came to Elkhart, Indiana or South Bend, but some did, 
but mostly it would be local people. Thursdays was when you know had your local programming and we had a, an issue-based show called 34 Front. So I worked on that and we would have different um, members of the community come in that had an issue and um, let people call and ask questions. Or maybe it was a national issue that people were concerned about. Um, I did the Mary Fisher show. Mary was a delight. She was um, a senior citizen who didn't drive. She rode her little pink bicycle around South Bend. <laughs> she had her little bun. And it was just a show for seniors. And she was just an absolute delight. Back in the, the 70s when uh, the, the program started, uh, we would have uh, uh, interviews with uh, state representatives, senators, uh, uh, we call it Capital Views at one time, and uh, every, every Sunday we would have uh, three state legislators, always uh, uh, at least one from, from each party, uh, always somebody from the Senate, somebody from the House, and uh, we would discuss the state issues and we would take phone calls. And, and that sometimes became very, very interesting in the year 2000 we hosted a statewide debate with uh, Senator Luger running at that time and David Johnson, his Democratic opponent. C-SPAN picked it up and we had a, a viewer we found out in the White House. Uh, President Clinton uh, contacted Senator Luger the next Monday morning and said, hey, I saw you on television uh, yesterday in that debate and he started talking about things that Luger had, uh, had discussed. So we even had a, a viewer in the White House. One of my favorite things to produce at NIT was a show called Across the Dial. Across the Dial was originally something called Music Michiana. And we, I think we renamed it that partly because we wanted to focus on how diverse the music was in the Michiana region and bring it you know, to, the, to the camera. Um, I co-produced that and co-directed it with Maureen Murray, who's now Maureen Green. Um, we would get audition recordings from all walks of music life in the Michiana area. We had rock bands perform cover songs. We had a banjo and violin duo perform. Uh, we had people come in and sing with an acoustic guitar. Um, a lot of different genres of music, just like you would have if you were sitting at your radio and turning that knob and passing by all these different radio stations. Tom Smith actually came to us at the station. You know, the commercial stations had uh, reporters that could go out with cameras, but we didn't have any kind of equipment like that. Tom had bought equipment and it was sophisticated enough that uh, it could, it was arable quality. And he needed experience and wanted experience. And we were desperate to have somebody that could help us go outside of the studio. We did programs that amounted to sort of half hour documentaries, right? We went to Grissom Air Force Base and we uh, interviewed some pilots of a KC-135, which would refuel the the, the fighter jet called the Warthog. And so we interviewed the pilots, but the main thing is we went up in the aircraft and when we showed the refueling and uh, we, we went to the, the zoo, Potawatomi Zoo. So Tom Smith, kind of a hero of those years. There were just so many volunteers, not only for the auction, but just for other programs and operations at the station. Open Studio was just an opportunity that was waiting to happen because of the fact that we were Michiana. That we had, you know, Indiana and Michigan, and we had like, what, 21 counties in a broadcast coverage reach, which has, you know, a lot of cities and a lot of towns and townships. And it was just like, let's give them a platform. Let's give them an open studio, a time to be able to shine and talk about their communities. I knew we would never run out of content. I'll never forget when I talked to the board about doing Open Studio and saying, hey, we're going to do a four-hour program about the communities in Michiana. And literally, I am not kidding, and maybe somebody else remembers this differently, but you could hear a pin drop. I mean, it was dead silence. 
And I know, I can even remember some of the questions. People were going, well, is anybody else doing that? Or what makes you think that this is gonna work? And when I tried to tell them the story about seeing the auction and really just basically making, instead of product, content, that it made all the sense in the world in my head, but you could see the skepticism on the board members. It was crazy. We're gonna bring the community into WNIT with this four hour live show every Sunday. Like four hours, that's like something like a network would do, not like a small or mid-sized PPS station. And so it was very daunting and like, it took so much orchestration just to plan out and figure out, all right, what city and where are we gonna go? And then what are our guests in contact? And there was so much lead time to try to plan it out. At the same time, you know, we were a very small crew and a lot of our, like a lot of our creatives were very young and we were using students on cameras. And so we somehow magically pulled off this miracle that we got a chance to do this four hour show. And then in the middle, after we sort of announced this, I was heading out of town to like Los Angeles because I wanted, I wanted to jump into a different career path. And that was, that, I remember Trina was like, you're what, you're doing what? I'm like, yeah, I gotta go. So the, the deal was is I would stay there until the show's first airing and then I would head out that week after the first airing. So we are now uh, trying to launch this four hour live show and most of us are pretty new to television and television production and we find out our boss is leaving, the one who helped shape this show. And uh, it was really a, a chance to, are we gonna step up? Can we make it happen? And we came together and said, yeah, we're gonna do this. And it was so exciting to really be a part of something like that, that every week went to a different community to find out what Michiana is all about and for all of us in the production department to really kind of spread our wings and grow because you really didn't have another choice. It was either sink or swim at that point. We soon had seven, I think, regular series running, which was more than any other station in the state. We also have really stretched ourselves in some ways in the things that we've done. Uh, we took on an animated series called Hip Hop Fables. We also did a, a Hispanic speaking show when none of us as a crew spoke Spanish, but we felt it was important to be a part of a, that community, which is part of Michigan. So Imagen Latina was a Spanish news program aired on WNIT years ago back in the 90s and it gave information about local and statewide um, news as it happened, as it happened. Um, so we were able to um, distribute that information to individuals that tuned in that only saw that um, their only source of Spanish news was, you know, um, the other news stations that were national. And that wasn't giving us what we wanted here locally. We wanted local news. One of my highlights working at the station was Hip Hop Fables. Um, it really allowed me to tap into who I am as a person. Like everybody who knows me knows that like I'm a hip hop guy, award winner, traveling, performing. And so when this idea came out to do a hip hop cartoon um, and they selected me to be the voice, like I was all over it. They allowed me to write my own songs, bring in my crew to do music and uh, additional voices. Uh, so to me, that was definitely a highlight. I remember coloring books coming out and waiting for the animations to, to come back every time we would get done performing. But even in then, it was still paying attention to the details, right? So it's not something we would just go and record. We went over it almost like it was a movie, you know, and it kept getting better and better and better. But to me, that's just one of those examples of how the station isn't uh, afraid to branch out and do something different. Let's talk a little bit about Dinner in a Book. How did that get started? And it's been on the air now for 20, 22 years. <laughs> it started with Open Studio, that four hour program we had on Sunday afternoons. And somebody would come in and stir a couple of things and that was the beginning of cooking shows. And then they decided we should have our own cooking show. And I was delighted to be asked to try something. But I also like the aspect of developing a cooking show around a book, dinner and a book. 
we had to do things that went along with the book. And uh, because I love books and I read 200 books a year. And uh, it's a joy to work with so many people that are creative and literate and articulate. And sometimes I can just stand there and go, wow, that was great. Now that's pretty oh. exciting, isn't it? When Open Studio was on, there was a segment called Outdoor Elements, and we tried to get guests who would talk about something outdoorsy. Although we tried to get Wildlife Incorporated or parks or whatever, we ended up with a lot of cats. I just remember cats. And that was fun, but it wasn't really Outdoor Elements. And eventually, we explored the idea of trying to get a hold of guests who were really more outdoors focused and wildlife focused and so that's how the show evolved into its own show where we could really emphasize what's going on in the natural world and way fewer cats <laughs> and you know i just remember having, you know, p lugging big heavy cameras and trying to just get out in the field and it was hard work and sometimes we were wading through mucky ground or climbing over branches. It was really hard, but to the team's effort, it persevered and we have a web presence and social media presence, which has been another evolution. And it's really been fun to hear people come up to me in the grocery store and say, oh, you know what, we always watch this program with our kids, or I watched it when I was a kid. I've done it many years, so I have all kinds of ages of folks come up to me and say they use it, they watch it. Teachers often have used it in their classroom. Now on the social media presence, organizations are sharing some of the segments. So it's really been a fun way to network and showcase the beauty of all of our natural resources and the people that work within them. One of the thrills I get is from our local programming. When we do a local documentary, the most common remark that I hear people say when they walk out of uh, wherever they may be viewing it is, I didn't know that. And that just goes right to my heart and that's exactly what we wanted to do is give you some information that you didn't know about. We ended up doing a documentary with a grant and Dave Barrett headed that up and Jerry Dodd directed it and it was done on location about Skylar Koufax who was at one time a vice president of the United States from Indiana. The Skyler Colfax program was the first program that we did that was outside the studio. We hadn't done anything outside before that time and it was just really exciting for all of us young people because none of us had ever worked in film before and we did a lot of it outside. We did it in a house that David had driven by and went and asked the owners if they could come shoot there. And the owner said, sure, and that's where we did it. And we used all my parents' furniture in a lot of the shops. It was aired in the summer of 1976, the Bicentennial. There was a regional public, a regional association of PBS stations, and they gave awards for outstanding local programming. And, and it won that award that year, which was very gratifying to me because the truth is, although I'd worked in radio, small town and college radio news, I mean, when I started at Channel 34, I had n literally no television experience, none. My grandfather was uh, connected to Studebaker, was responsible for all painting that was done interior and exterior when Studebaker closed its doors. So I knew a lot of people that were involved with Studebaker. And I felt that it was important that we do something to talk about the corporation. My feeling was is that no one had really gone and tackled what PBS could do by showing how difficult it was and how complicated it was. It wasn't anyone's fault. So it was a complicated story to try and put together. So I went ahead and wrote a grant and we're, we're lucky enough to receive a $50,000 grant which may have been the largest or one of the largest 
that the Indiana Committee for the Humanities had ever uh, given. And uh, Scott Craig uh, was interested and was willing to do it, but that wasn't going to be enough money for him to be able to bring a film crew and to do editing in Chicago and to hire uh, an announcer for it. You know, it's one of those things that there is no perfect example of a creative activity that is a group effort than what television, and I think particularly public television, is all about. And so that meant all the pieces had to kind of fall into place. And WBBM then went for Scott and myself uh, to, uh, for the Emmy, for uh, Chicago Emmy, for, um, for producers. And we were able to get that. And then also put us in for a George Foster Peabody. And we were also fortunate enough to get that as well. There was a newly formed series called Stories from Michiana. And I don't remember if any docs had aired in it yet, but um, when I got there, one of my first assignments was make a doc for that series. And the department bantied around a lot of different ideas of what, you know, what would be interesting to people, what do people not know about, what do they need to know about. And the first documentary I was able to do was on the Pokagon Band of Potawatomi. Being unfamiliar with the tribe, I had to do some research. There was an ethnohistory written as part of the process for gaining federal recognition that I was able to get a hold of and read. And this was really an important thing for the tribe because uh, over 30 years in the process of getting federal recognition. Can you imagine that? You, you send in an application and 30 years goes by and there is no definitive action. And the focus of the To Be Called a Nation was actually just getting through that bureaucracy. You know, what do they need to do? What still needs to be done? This was, I think, 1991 when I finished that documentary. Having had that experience, there was so much more to the culture of the tribe. I really wanted people to know more and I wanted to learn more. The footage I could not use in To Be Called a Nation, uh, it was only a half hour documentary, and additional footage ended up becoming Keepers of the Fire. And uh, that name came from what some of the tribal elders had told me about the um, Pokagon Band of Potawatomi and the Potawatomi role in the uh, Indian Nation. And I remember the first project that we did was called Raising an American Legend, which was, at the time, the largest wood peg building constructed in America. Then we also did uh, Tarazze. Uh, Alexander Tarazze was just an amazing talent. Michiana's Rising Star was one of those shows that we were trying to t uh, capture the, the popularity of American Idol. So I remember the first show, we had uh, a tremendous amount of, of people ap uh, applying, but we had to narrow it down to like 100. Our town was already being uh, done in other stations, and we got the community really excited about doing all these li little segments. And what you would get is a mosaic of a town, not only the history, but you would learn about characters different characters that people knew in the town. And seeing each other on television is still quite a thing, and I think people really enjoyed it. Because I'm so into history, these documentaries kind of hit home for me because I love hearing people's stories. I love hearing how they got there, what they did at the time. I, I step back and I almost close my eyes to think about what they were doing at the time, what that might have been like to grow up in that era. I bump into people here and there, and they go, man, I love that documentary. And that's the reason I, I felt really compelled to do this, because I want to keep that history alive. Being young and uh, getting a chance to be a storyteller was a dream come true for me. One of the things that was unique about WNIT, uh, and I didn't know how unique it was till I met people from other television markets doing this similar kind of thing, 
is that we had so much creative freedom. We had freedom to research, we had the freedom to tell a story the way we wanted to tell a story. It's like, oh, you wanna go shoot today? There's a gear, go shoot. There's something about that connection to people you worked on very early when you were all figuring it out together that I think has, is special and different in some way. The people that run the stations live in community. They know what the community needs. So they can either produce pro that kind of programming that fits a need or they can look for programming that meets that unique need. And I think that, again, in this environment where so much content is created elsewhere, to have an organization that is very focused on local is, is profoundly important. And many times I talk about it, it's really like the secret sauce of public media. And why I think we matter so much right now is the fact that we do live in the communities we serve and that we have an investment in those communities. We're in the process of, of uh, raising the money to be able to move the station into a different location. And then one very cold day in January, I got a call and that uh, to come down to the station because it was on fire. This is the administration building which was just behind the Career Center which the station had been in for many years, 20 years at least. And uh, so I went down there and it was in flames. Any fire is such a, uh, is a level of destruction that most people cannot fathom that have never been through one. And yeah, it was amazing. Uh, the, the buildings, the way they were, they went quick. Yeah, yeah, they, they went real back. quick. Well, most of the, uh, like the trailer, yeah. Okay, yeah. But yeah, that, and, and that was 2009, and we were in the construction project of rehabbing WSBT. So, you know, we had, you know, most oh, of the tech staff was over, Mike and Tom were over here working this end of it. We used to do Politically Speaking live, uh, taking phone calls from viewers, uh, interacting with our state legislators. But one Sunday, it became a little bit more than that when our administration building caught on fire. And it caught on fire as we were arriving. I was directing the show that day, uh, but took time to go over and get footage of our buildings burning down. But then we had to, as a crew, get focused and go back to the show, because our show was still live. And so we started uh, that show and we let everybody know what was going on. And with about 10 minutes to go in that hour show, the power went out. Now, fortunately, we had some back out power for some things, but not our lights. And so here we are with the last 10 minutes. Our legislators just kept on talking, but we were in the dark. Uh, so we finished that show that day, and then uh, it was time to start assessing the damage and pick up the pieces. We, we were fortunate that at that time, we had already signed with SBT and they were moving out of their building. So it practically took over a year to get the place renovated and ready for our, us to move in. So we moved in to the brand new building. <clears throat> we got settled a bit and then determined that our local profile was strong enough that we could create a daily half hour show a show called Experience Michiana. I've been fortunate to be the producer of that show for its 12 plus years now. And when we started, it was quite an undertaking because it was a five days a week daily show, something we had never done before. And uh, Gordy Young came on to be our host. He had such uh, credibility in the community and experience doing a daily show. And so again, we stretched ourselves by adding Experience Michiana to our shows like dinner and a book, and politically speaking, and outdoor elements that are still going. And so we've added a lot of other shows since then. Education Counts is another one. We try to tell the stories of our community and meet the needs that our community has. So in terms of Education Counts, like amplifying local voices, I think it's what's great about the way that like segments are produced, as an example, is that it's sharing something at a very basic, I wanna say basic level, but at a community level, it isn't, like these segments are designed for teachers to learn best practices that they can put in their classroom. Um, it's designed to just talk about this, what this is happening, right, at a level that everybody can connect to. So a teacher might see it and say, that's really cool, I want to try that. A parent might see that and say, I want my kids to be at a school that does that, or I want my school to do the same thing. The decisions about what gets to be on the airways of public television, whether we're talking about 
documentaries or whether we're talking about Sesame Street, they're not driven by some algorithm. Uh, they're driven by people who have a commitment to making communities in the country better off. And I think that's more important than ever. You don't work in public television because you want to make a lot of money. You work in public television because you know you're doing something good. You know you're providing a service to a lot of people. And that's why public broadcasting, the producers, the content that public broadcasting has created, is created by people who are human, who have a heart, who have a soul, who love what they do, who love the communities that they live in. Public broadcasting always seems to me to be the eyes, the ears, and the very soul of the community. We started out, of course, uh, 50 years ago with one part-time channel. And of course that grew to full-time and uh, at the start of the digital age of television 20 years ago we became two channels. Today we have five. And, and one of those five is the Michigan Learning Channel where it's just devoted for pure learning. And uh, I think we may evolve into more of that. ATSC 3.0 will, will take any IP stream, any computer data stream, you can put literally anything on there. So it can be part video, it can be part uh, computer data, it can be mostly computer data. Uh, so it's very versatile. And so when people ask me, what does the future of PBS look like? What does the future of our stations look like? What does WNIT look like in the future? I think it will be a robust media organization that will have content available in multiple places that will be very much focused on the community as it always has been. And the content that it produces will improve the lives of individuals and families in the community, and that I think we can count on for decades to come. We, we got the satellite, and I remember there were some other stories I, I'm not real familiar with. I know, I remember Clem getting phone calls all the time from people convinced that that's why their washing machine broke. And, <laughs> oh, and, geez. and he had to explain to them, it's a receive only dish. We don't, we're not. And I'm proud to say that um, 50 years later, I'm still doing on-air play <laughs> at a completely different place. I'm retired. I'm now a volunteer. So it all started many years ago at a little TV station in South Bend Elkhart. <laughs> Before you even knew what a tote bag was. From signal to story. 50 Years of WNIT Public Television is brought to you by our presenting sponsors, Barb and John Fair Foundation. Congratulations to WNIT on your 50th anniversary. Thank you for 50 years of great entertainment and education. Gurley Leap Automotive Family, Mel Hall, and our Gold Level Sponsors, our Silver Level Sponsors. Additional funding from Signal to Story, 50 years of WNIT public television has been provided by Thank you. This WNIT local production has been made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you.